Tonight on Currents News, a top American church leader is installed in his new post, but from a distance. This cathedral is empty. And a famous diocese of Brooklyn institution, the Giglio Feast, won't grace the skies this year, but organizers are vowing to come back strong after the pandemic. Next year, the feast is bigger and better than ever, and we're going to lift it through the sky. A coronavirus treatment could be here by summer. The search is on in New York City. Plus, it's Nurses Appreciation Week. We honor one of the bravest. She's on the front lines despite her own illness. When I'm at work, I'm taking care of people. So it's not about me and my sickness. It's now about them. And African Americans are being infected at alarming rates. The pastor of a historic black parish, Father Alonzo Cox, talks about ministering to the community. The news starts right now. A new shepherd is now leading the Archdiocese of Atlanta. Archbishop Gregory Hartmeyer's installation is traditional. How it was done is not. Good evening, I'm Christine Persichetti. The pandemic and the need to stay apart is making today's ceremony unlike any other. Instead of thousands packing the Christ the King Cathedral, most of those in attendance looked on from the choir loft. Currents News' Emily Druby has the story. A historic moment, a socially distanced installation. An empty cathedral, no hugs or greetings, instead prayers for the sick. For all those who suffer the consequences of the current pandemic. That was the unique scene as Atlanta Archbishop Gregory Hartmeyer was installed, a new normal during the pandemic. Those I love, those I revere, those I have been asked to tend in his name are not gathered around me. This cathedral is empty. At the Cathedral of Christ the King in Atlanta, there were many differences from a traditional installation. Clergy stood a safe distance apart while others, including Currents News, watched the live stream from home. To the spiritual needs. And the appointment decree from Pope Francis was read on video by his representative, Archbishop Christophe Pierre, who would normally be in the cathedral. To serve faithfully. But the new leader of Atlanta's Catholic Church was not discouraged. There will be a time when we will gather together and celebrate. The Archbishop is originally from Buffalo, New York. He's been the Bishop of Savannah, Georgia since 2011 and has spent a lot of time working in schools. He's now the seventh Archbishop of Atlanta. He's replacing Archbishop Wilton Gregory, who became the head of the Washington, D.C. Archdiocese last year. Atlanta has been without a leader for a year. National correspondent for the Tablet and Crux, Christopher White, thinks that could be a factor in holding the ceremony amid the pandemic. Pope Francis, the Holy See, recognizes uh, that we don't know how long uh, these restrictions will last. A much needed church shepherd during a most unusual time for the church and the world. Emily Druby, Currents News. Brooklyn native and bishop-elect Kevin Sweeney is still discussing plans and possibilities for his installation. The pastor of St. Michael's Parish in Sunset Park is set to be the eighth bishop of the Diocese of Patterson, New Jersey. Stay tuned to Currents News for updates on his journey. The Giglio Feast will be back stronger than ever. That's the vow of Our Lady of Mount Carmel pastor, Monsignor Jamie Gigantiello. For more than a century, the famous celebration has been great for evangelization and fundraising. The coronavirus crisis forced its cancellation this year. Cards News' Jessica Easthope has the story. Unprecedented times call for tough decisions. As much as it, it's a, a, a painful decision to make, we had to make it. For the first time since World War II, the Giglio will not dance in the sky above Williamsburg. But Our Lady of Mount Carmel pastor, Monsignor Jamie Gigantiello, knows the tradition will endure. Next year, the feast is bigger and better than ever, and we're going to lift it through the sky. For the last 117 years, thousands of men have carried the tradition on their shoulders. 
watching their fathers and grandfathers come up through the church and take on the task of lifting the seven-story four-ton tower. I would never know how close I would have stayed to the church growing up have had I not been so drawn into the tradition. Like many who participate, John Perone, a member of the feast committee, has since moved away from the old neighborhood. Every year, the feast takes him back. It was the highlight of my summer as a kid, and I just grew more and more attracted to it. The Giglio has watched the neighborhood change from 72 feet in the air. In recent years, new people meant having to recruit new lifters. We wanted to share the tradition with other people who previously just might have thought that, hey, I, I need to know somebody to get in. Now, Monsignor Jamie says it's time to make the Giglio Feast part of the church's evangelization efforts once again. All the young people question what is it that these people are coming for? And maybe they'll say, you know, I want to be a part of that. Monsignor Jamie's not worried about the life of the feast, but what is a concern is what happens to Our Lady of Mount Carmel without its biggest fundraiser during a year when churches are closed. We rely on the profits of the feast to support the parish for the whole year. The feast committee is now reaching out in different ways with raffles and donations to help meet its financial goal, all while keeping the real goal in mind. That is our only goal, right? To continue its tradition, to keep our parish healthy, and um, to pass this on to the next generation. For now, the Giglio remains on the ground, while the fate of this year's feast is still up in the air. Jessica Easthope, Currents News. A big change this morning as the Little Sisters of the Poor got ready to make their case before the U.S. Supreme Court. They held a virtual prayer rally. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The online rosary was organized by the Conference of Major Superiors of Women and the nonprofit law firm representing the nuns. After the service, the lawyers made oral arguments to the justices over the phone, a historic change because of the pandemic. The Little Sisters are appealing the Obamacare contraceptive mandate, saying they have a religious exemption from the law that violates their deeply held beliefs. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg took part in the oral arguments this morning from her hospital bed. The 87-year-old is recovering from a gallbladder condition. The leader of the court's liberal minority, Ginsburg, seemed critical of exempting employers with religious or moral objections to the mandate. She's expected to remain in the hospital for a day or two. She has survived four bouts with cancer. Pharmaceutical company Regeneron says it might have a treatment for coronavirus available by the end of summer. The hope is high for an old therapy turned new and researchers are racing to find a cure. The key to making a brand new drug for COVID-19 could be in this vial of blood. It comes from this man, Eli Epstein, who's recovered from coronavirus. Now doctors at the Rockefeller University in New York City are searching his blood for just the right antibodies. You really want something very potent. Potent means can neutralize kill the virus. It's a twist on the use of convalescent plasma, where someone who's recovered from COVID gives blood directly to someone who's sick. That can work, but it's old technology. The new approach uses monoclonal antibodies and it's cutting edge. Here's how it works. When someone is sick with COVID, antibodies inside their blood fight off the virus. After the person recovers, they donate blood. Scientists select the most powerful antibodies, clone them, and turn it into a drug. It's one of the hottest areas in COVID research. Companies in New York and San Francisco, Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, even the Department of Defense and many more are involved in monoclonal antibody research. Here's the team at Vanderbilt picking their favorite antibodies. These are all distinct, hitting the same site, but distinct antibodies. The treatment could possibly prevent infection or treat those already sick. Vanderbilt's lead researcher on the project, Dr. James Crow, specializes in vaccines, but he says monoclonal antibody research will be faster. I think antibodies will be finished first and will be the bridge toward longer immunity, which will be conferred by vaccines. So fast that the pharmaceutical company Regeneron says they might be able to have their monoclonal antibody drug on the market by the end of the summer. And with so much work on this, I think the more groups we have working on it, all the better. And, and the more shots on goal we have for getting an effective uh, prevention or treatment. 
Regeneron's technology is already being used to treat cancer, arthritis, and asthma. Everyone's hoping for a treatment sooner rather than later, especially the hard-hit black community. The Associated Press analyzed data from 25 states, which shows more than one-third of those who have died from coronavirus are black. For example, here in New York State, black people made up, make up 9% of the population and 17% of the deaths, while in Louisiana, 32% of the population is black and they make up more than 70% of those who have died from COVID-19. And stay with us for more on the community and their concerns. Father Alonzo Cox, the coordinator of the Vicariate for Black Catholic Concerns, will be with us. That's still ahead in this newscast. The White House Coronavirus Task Force is not going away. President Trump had suggested a day earlier that it would be phased out in the coming weeks. Today he's saying the group, led by Vice President Mike Pence, has done a fantastic job. He wants them to keep at it indefinitely with a focus on safety and opening up the country again. And here are some other headlines. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is saying the U.S. can't be certain the coronavirus started in a Wuhan, China lab, but there is evidence. General Motors, the country's largest automaker, intends to reopen its U.S. and Canadian plants on May 18th. The CVS pharmacy chain is reporting its profits soared by more than 40 percent. Customers stocked up on medication and other essentials. New York's Democratic primary is back on. A federal judge ordering state officials to hold the election in June. The presidential primary was scrapped late last month because of the coronavirus. The state also removed from the ballot candidates who suspended their campaigns. The court is saying those names have to be restored for the June 23rd election. For Mother's Day, the cemeteries of the Archdiocese of New York will be open for visitation. There are five cemeteries operated by the trustees of St. Patrick's Cathedral. The sites are located in Queens, Staten Island, and upstate. They will be open from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Sunday, May 10th. Family and friends are being asked to limit their visits to 15 minutes, and no more than 10 people will be permitted at a grave site at one time. There's a lot more news headed your way. A time to honor the heroes among us during this pandemic and the story of one nurse who's putting her patients' lives before her own. Plus, online learning could be the wave of the future, what the governor is saying about your child's education. And with sobering statistics on the coronavirus death rate among black people, how a Brooklyn priest is ministering to this community. Now you can help us put your faith in the news. The next time you capture a newsworthy event, send us your pictures or video. It's easy. Go to netny.tv slash send us and you may see your submission on Currents News. Nurses are always vital, especially now in the face of a pandemic. As part of National Nurses Week, Currents News is taking the time to honor those putting themselves on the line. Michelle Powers has the story of one woman who shows up to work each day, despite the fact that for her, it could be the most dangerous place. These are my nebulizers. Megan Benedetto knows what it's like to gasp for air, to not have the lung capacity to even sit up even like get out of bed um which is not like me at all she's not a covid 19 survivor instead she's a cystic fibrosis warrior battling a disease that only gets worse over time even before she could stand in her own crib i was nine months old when my mom found out news that changed her family's life their baby would always have persistent lung infections that would limit her ability to breathe Meg's condition would flare up 27 years later, just as the coronavirus was brewing. I dropped like 20 pounds. My doctor was like, all right, we're just going to do like a diabetes test. We're just going to see what's going on because you have no exp explanation of all this weight loss. People with diabetes and cystic fibrosis are considered to be at high risk to the coronavirus. They've been advised to cocoon, to literally not leave their homes. But Meg isn't cocooning. She's flourishing in perhaps the most dangerous place for her. She's a nurse at NYU Langone, a hospital at the epicenter of the pandemic. It's on my floor. It's not like I'm excluded. My whole, hosp like, my whole hospital has it. When New York had its first case, she thought about taking a leave of absence, and no one would blame her, but she hasn't. After years of her own suffering and nurses coming to her aid in surgeries and pick lines, 
She's decided her spot is on the front line with her fellow nurses. She's trusting them to look out for her. So the nurses are really taking care of you and their patients. They're doing everything they could and um, it was very difficult. It, it's still kind of very difficult because I can't help them. But she is helping them. Since Meg can't directly treat COVID patients, she's been doing everything else necessary to keep the hospital and her co-workers going, never letting a sickness get the best of her. My parents kind of raised me that I was just like any other kid. The only thing is I had like a really bad cough and I would get really out of breath. They put their daughter in every sport and Megan even went on to swim division one. They still support her today, banging pots and pans at 7 o'clock each and every night. Just like in her own life, Megan has accepted the illness, and every day she fights to overcome it. That's it. Like, there's no, like, there's nowhere to run. You just have to, mm -hmm. like, deal with it. This pandemic is no different. Sometimes, she says, you just have to run head on into your challenges. Since the crisis started, she's been taking long runs by her church, St. Bernadette, in Diker Heights, just to stop and say a prayer, not for herself, but for everyone else. It's not about me and my sickness, it's now about them. And then she just keeps going. Michelle Powers, Currents News. Brooklyn's Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio is praising nurses for being on the front lines of the coronavirus crisis. In a video released today, he explained his closeness to the profession. I think I understand the psychology of nurses. My sister has been a nurse for over 40 years. Nurses are caring people. Nurses are people who give themselves to others very, very readily because this is their, their psychology, their nature, the vocation that they followed out. The bishop also pointed to the risks the nurses are taking, likening them to the risks the Lord took for us. And in both cases, it's done with love. Black people are dying from coronavirus at twice the rate of white people here in New York City. That's according to the city's Department of Health. And one man knows that all too well. Father Alonzo Cox, coordinator of the African-American Apostolate in the Diocese of Brooklyn, joins us now to talk about these disturbing statistics. And Father Cox, another stat from the CDC says while black people make up 13 percent of the U.S. population, they account for 33 percent of coronavirus hospitalizations. What goes through your mind when you hear these statistics? It, it, it's really just, um, it's heartbreaking. You know, um, many of the uh, African-American community, they, they do have underlying um, health issues, such as diabetes and um, some heart uh, issues. And it's important uh, that they follow, you know, staying at home. Cause that, that's really just the important um, part of all of this. But you're absolutely right. You know, this virus has killed, um, a great number of African Americans, and I, I feel it here in my own parish. It just uh, my, my parish is dominantly African American, Caribbean, West Indian, and to see the lives taken uh, by this deadly virus is just—it's heartbreaking. I was going to ask you that. What are your parishioners saying to you about this? It, it's it's tough. You know, um, we lost one of our oldest parishioners, 104 years old, and um, she. Uh, she, she, she got the virus and, you know, the, the toughest part of all of this is not being able to celebrate funeral masses for them, mm -hmm. not being mm -hmm. able to, to celebrate the lives of, of, of these wonderful people. So I, I did promise them that once um, we're in better times, uh, we're going to be able to have a memorial mass to celebrate their lives. How have you been helping your parishioners since there's no face to face relationships anymore? What we've been doing here at St. Martin de Porres is, is that we've been live streaming um, all of our masses, both our Sunday masses and our daily mass. Um, each week, I'm able to put out a message to the people, particularly here at St. Martin de Porres. But our YouTube page is, is all over uh, the diocese, especially with the uh, community that I serve with, within the African American Apostolate. So reaching out to them through the gift of social media has been very helpful and, and recognizing that um, I'm praying for them and I'm, I'm with them. What is your message to the community? <laughs> Uh, first and foremost, to stay safe. 
you know, I, I know that everybody wants to come back to church, but, um, you know, we, we're going to take this in phases, step by step. Uh, but it's important to know that um, the Lord is, is with them. Even though they're at home, you know, the Lord is continuously uh, with them. You know, they're, they're praying with us. They're praying. We're, we're a community, even though we're not together. So just keeping that all of that in mind. And how has this pandemic affected you? Um, it's been tough. It's been tough to see um, my people go through this. You know, um, it, it, it's been a very, very, very tough, you know, couple of weeks. And, you know, both me and Father Kingsley are, are trying our best just to make sure that they know that their priests are with them. And I think that's really important, um, that their spiritual leader is, is praying for them and that we're, we're, all, we're in this all together. All right, Father Alonzo Cox, the coordinator of the African-American Apostolate in the Brooklyn Diocese, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Online learning could be here to stay. Governor Andrew Cuomo wants to reimagine education through technology. In a partnership with the Gates Foundation, Cuomo says they're exploring education alternatives. The governor says the pandemic should trigger a willingness to adapt and modernize because he says the old model where people sit in the classroom is not going to work in the new normal. Two Catholic schools are closing in part because of the coronavirus. Holy Family College in Wisconsin says enrollment and fundraising challenges were made more difficult because of the pandemic. The Institute of Notre Dame in Baltimore also blames decreased enrollment and says the virus added financial hardship. Meanwhile, schools in Wuhan, China, where the outbreak first began, opened their doors again. More than 100 schools reopened Wednesday. Students and teachers wore masks and their temperatures were taken before entering their classrooms. The coronavirus crisis is leaving senior citizens at risk to new scams because they're often living in isolation. Experts warn seniors are particularly vulnerable, including to stimulus check fraud. Click here to go to this website and register for your stimulus check, which obviously is not true. Asking for personal uh, information, credit card numbers or bank account numbers, your social security number, uh, that is a scam. The pros say now is the time for family and friends to check up on seniors. Still to come on Currents News, praying for a better world after the pandemic, what the Pope wants us all to do next week. Also ahead. <laughs> The milestone reached that caused this celebration in Oregon. Pope Francis is dedicating a day of prayer, fasting, and charitable works to end COVID-19. The Holy Father inviting everyone, regardless of religion, to take part in the initiative on May 14th. The Higher Committee of Human Fraternity, which originally proposed the day, wants everyone to ask God to bless and safeguard the world so it will be better than before the pandemic. Finally tonight, a battle won in the war against coronavirus. <laughs> Hector Calderon was cheered as he left an Oregon hospital today. He was the first person in that state to be diagnosed with the virus. And after more than two months of treatment, he was released and had a message for those who saved his life. Thank you so much for all your hard work and they dedicated all your time to me. So I'll, my family and I, we are so thankful for, and thank you for everything. God bless you, and thank you for everything. Hector was reportedly one of the first COVID-19 patients to be treated with the drug remdesivir. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time. Good night.